In, anybody new to fly fishing in here? Okay. Really new, like, don't even like brand know new. Anything. Okay, cool. Because I know we do have some fly fishermen in here, but <clears throat> we're going to talk a little bit about fly fishing, saltwater fly fishing. But we're going to talk about the science of the fish. But we're really going to get into cobia and talking about you know what's going on with cobia and the lack of cobia, and, but how to catch them on fly. And you'll hear. Bo and I, we're just going to have a conversation. And you guys have questions, just jump right in. We're going to make this a conversation. So you just jump right in, right, if you got a question. All right? All right. All right, I think we're ready. We'll get started. Good? All right. <clears throat> this is a, the very first uh, seminar on saltwater fly fishing. And uh, we're going to do this on a species basis every once a month here with Legendary. We're going to talk about a particular species and how to catch them on a fly rod, talk about the life history of the fish. <clears throat> and we're just going to basically have a conversation about how to do it, how much fun it is, and how, you know, saltwater fly fishing is different. It's, it's unique. But if it's a fish, you can catch it on a fly rod. And it's, it's more than just a lot of fun. It's, there's something more to it. And uh, it's a growing sport. And there's people all over the country that are, you know, it's a younger generation that's really embraced fly fishing, both in the freshwater side, but they're getting into it in the saltwater side, too. Everyone's dream on a fly rod is to catch a tarpon or catch a GT, you know, or even go down to Costa Rica and catch a sailfish or a marlin. If you get a small enough marlin, you can get him on a fly rod. And anyway, I wanted to thank the guys here at Legendary for inviting us. This wouldn't happen without them. And I'm John Burns. I run uh, Fly Tide 30A. It's a saltwater fly fishing school over on Choctahatchee Bay in Santa Rosa Beach. And I've worked in the past with Ashley as a fly fishing manager at Orvis. And I've been fly fishing in salt water since the mid-70s, but probably nowhere near as long in the water around here as Bo Walker. And that's why Bo agreed to join us to speak more about the history of fly fishing here on the Emerald Coast and about fly fishing in general as a captain. So <clears throat> he's a fishing guide. If you like Oyster City uh, beer, you got this man to thank for it, and there's some new products that are on their way that um, Bo's part of as well. So, Bo, thank not you with for being here. <laughs> What's that? And not with Oyster City. Right. right. <laughs> no, no longer with Oyster City. And, yeah. All right. <clears throat> and then Charles O'Neill, Ashley, and of course the entire legendary team. We really appreciate you guys. Thank you for inviting us to do this. Here's Bo doing his thing out on the water. He likes skinny water. He's a big man on a skinny boat, <laughs> and he's been around forever. And you're going to get a lot of insight from Bo as we work our way through this presentation. Here's the entire legendary team. Again, we really thank you guys for having us here. And if you're here and you don't know who to look for, there's Chuck in the group. You look for these guys. They're here to sell you a boat, and they'll get you in a good one. So there's a face that you can look for, and you find these guys at any time, they'll help you out. Legendary just doesn't just sell boats. They've got some fishy dudes here, too. They know a little thing about fly fishing. So not just conventional spin, but fly fishing as well. And they know a little bit about fishing, and they can talk, you, talk to you about fishing as well as boats. And if it wasn't for this lady, I would not be here. <laughs> She's a dynamo. Chuck will tell you, it's his wife. She keeps me on my toes and keeps the wheels turning. And as you can see, she's got a lawnmower in the back seat there. So <clears throat> you, you, you want to get energized by anything, you talk to Ashley. She's the one. <laughs> All right, so with that, we're going to go ahead and get started with this. This is a conversation. I want you guys to join in as, as you can. I want to make this very personal so we have just a back and forth about this particular fish in the, on the Emerald Coast and about fly fishing in general. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start off here with a little short 
uh, six, seven minute video about the history of saltwater fly fishing. And um, but before I start it, Bo, do you have anything you want to throw in here? I, I think I'm point? good so far. I, 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 you've covered everything All as, right. it, as, as far as the beginning goes. So. Okay. <laughs> All right, good. All right, so I'm going to get this video going. It's only about six or seven minutes. And um, let's see here. Welcome to the American Museum of Fly Fishing's landmark exhibit. It's the first of its kind. It's called On Fly what? in the Salt. What about? America's oh. saltwater fly fishing from surf to the flats. In this exhibit, we'll tell you stories of fascinating people, places, and innovations in fly fishing gear. A few words about the American Museum of Fly Fishing. It's the largest in the country with 163,000 fishing items to share with you and whose stories we share with you. I'm Nancy Zakon, trustee of the museum, and I'm very proud to present to you Andy Mill, our narrator. Andy is a Olympic skier twice over and fell in love with fly fishing and has now won more tarpon tournaments than anyone else on record. Andy is the, you could think of him as the Tiger Wood of tarpon tournaments. He and his son have produced Millhouse podcasts viewed in 97 countries. Andy, take us on our journey. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you for the kind words. From the glassy mosaics of clear water flats to the fierceness of the open ocean, saltwater fly fishing serves up a mix of mental and physical challenges that delivers sheer primal excitement. For many, the sport seems a recent phenomenon that burst onto the angling stage during the late 1950s. In fact, it is as ancient as all angling. In America, fly fishers took long rods to the salt as early as the 1760s. However, it was the late 1920s and into the 30s and 40s when pioneers like Tom Loving, Homer Rhodes, and Harold Gibbs began to attract the attention of inquisitive anglers. These groundbreaking fly fishers were explorers and innovators. They brought tackle designed for freshwater trout and salmon to the saltwater fish in bays, surf, and even deeper offshore zones. It is their work, along with the technological advances, that led to the near-explosive development of the sport from the late 1950s through the 1970s, sometimes referred to as saltwater fly fishing's golden era. They represent the tenacity, passion, and leadership of the many visionaries who made saltwater fly fishing what it is today. Flip Pallet once remarked the sport is, coursing with adventure of travel, and fish that could stop a freight train. Here's Flip now. He's known as the fly fishing world's Aldo Leopold. Thinking back, I think my first involvement in saltwater fly fishing probably stems back to, uh, to adventures along the Tamiami Trail Canal, a canal that runs all the way from Miami across the state to Tampa. And as kids, we used to plug cast for snook in that canal, religiously, when we should have been in school. Myself and Chico and Norman Duncan and John Emery. And one day, plug fishing there, we drove up in my ancient pickup on two guys who were fly fishing for snook on the trail. First time I had ever seen it. It was Ted Williams and a guy named Rocky Weinstein. They were buddies and fished, fly fished the trail for snook all the time. And Chico and I stood there and watched these men fly cast and were amazed. I mean, we had no idea what they were doing or why. 
and we followed them for hours, watching them catch snook on a fly rod. And we knew immediately that we had to do this. And fortunately, Ted Williams loved young people. I'm not sure he liked older people that much, but he really loved young people and he really liked fisher folk. So he was willing to share with us and help, help me get started recommending rods and lines and reels and so forth. And so that was really my very, very first exposure. And because I was young and had time, uh, no disposable income as I recall, but tons of time, I was able to cleave to it immediately and spend time doing it and learn and, and uh, begin a life of it. I, I think my television work over the years probably has influenced saltwater fly fishing in, in, in two ways probably, hopefully. Uh, one would be the ethic of fly fishing in general, but specifically saltwater because I've been exposed uh, or have exposed people more to saltwater fly fishing than to freshwater. And I, I hope that the ethic of that kind of fishing gets across to the public. That's, that's what my hope is. My feeling is that it does. But the whole, the whole being in touch with the natural world as you fly fish, the whole <clears throat> catch and release aspect of fly fishing, um, I think is one of the messages that I've tried so hard over years to deliver and, and hopefully it's, it's found its way. The other, the other way that I think um, my work has influenced people with regard to saltwater fly fishing is to show them what's possible with a fly rod. People have always thought historically that fly rods were tools for catching trout or sunfish or maybe largemouth bass, but blue marlin have only in recent years figured into people's perception of what can be done with a fly rod. And so uh, because of the great good fortune of what I was able to do and the places that I was able to travel with a fly rod in salt water, it gave people to realize what they could do, that they could bone fish, that they could fish for tuna and sailfish and marlin and snapper and every manner of saltwater fish. Virtually every single saltwater fish is a candidate for the saltwater fly rods. And so those two ways, I think, are the major impacts that I've had. Let's see how saltwater fly fishing began in America. While we were still a colony of Britain in 1764, Rodney Hume, working for the new British governor of the West Florida colony, wrote, We have plenty of saltwater trout and fine fishing with fly in the freshwater rivers, too. In the 1800s, Jerome Smith authored Natural History of Fishes of Massachusetts, where he described Cape Cod fishing for salters and fly fishing for striped bass. So popular were the striped bass that in the late 1800s, the fish car, a train with 450 small striped bass from the East Coast departed Red Bank, New Jersey and headed west. The fish were contained in milk cans and attended by J.G. Woodbury, who supplied fresh water and oxygen through physical labor. Amazingly, 300 small striped bass survived the transcontinental trip. Here is Nick Curcion, the C All right. <clears throat> That video goes on for some time. It's a really good one to check out and, and to finish watching this, but it's a, an excellent history uh, of saltwater fly fishing. And you'll, you get to hear from a lot of the experts. And I think Flip Pallet tells it, well, tells it very well in that there's something more to fly fishing than just catching fish. There's a, there's a passion about it. I certainly have it. I know Bo has it. And there's a lot of other guys and women in this area that have a real passion for saltwater fly fishing in the area. So let's get back on track here. 
with the presentation. So just like Flip had mentioned, if it's a fish, you know, we've come to realize over the years that you can catch it on a fly rod. You know, maybe not a 900 pound marlin, but you certainly can catch just about any fish that's out there on a fly rod. It's just, you have to learn how to do it. And there's different techniques um, involved. This is Bo here with a big red fish. <coughs> Caught brown Appalach. All right, how much that one weigh? Come on up. Bo, I think this is a good spot. I didn't give you a chance to introduce yourself. Would you introduce yourself to the audience? I'll be glad to. Oh, I'll turn that on for you. There we go. Sorry. No, you're good. All right, you're good. All right, so got, my name is Bo Walker. I am, a, I am a very retired fishing guide. So that means it's been a long time since I've done this for a living. I, I don't proselytize to be anybody who does this 250 days a year anymore. Um, this was back when I might have been in that 200 day a year realm. And, and I'm guessing that to be about an eight or a nine pound fish. Um, he, is, he is an Apalachicola Bay fish. He's behind the island, one of the many they have there. And that is during tarpon season. So if this was a color photograph, what you would see in this fish is he's almost silver. So he, he's, he's done with his winter in Apalachicola Bay. He spent a lot of time off, off the beach. And, uh, and yeah, he, he, believe it or not, that was a bycatch on the way home. We spotted him running and stopped and, and made the cast and actually caught that fish. Um, so I spent uh, about 20 years as a guide, 16, 18 years as a guide, either seriously or in the last two years, not so seriously, which kind of ends up being the way guide careers go. Um, after that, so it, when I was asked by John to, to, get, to, give, a, to, to give a bio on myself, I, I said three lines. I said, <laughs> dirt bag fisherman, dirt bag brewer, dirt bag distiller. And, and then the last, the last sentence was Vom Vivant and Raconteur, meaning that I was kidding. And uh, so I've spent the better part of my life either on the water or wasting my time right next to it. Um, <laughs> when, I, when I opened my brewery, which was the Oyster City Brewing Company in Apalachicola, along with my three partners, um, we, were, we, were within, we were within visual range of mile marker three at the mouth of the Apalachicola River. So while I built my business, I got to sneak off and tarp and fish around the top. And so I've, I've been a very, very fortunate Gulf Coaster. And, that, and that's my basic bio. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, I appreciate you being here, Bo. And there's, Bo's going to have a lot. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And Bo's going to have a lot of insight on a lot of what we're going to present here. I spent 35 years as a biologist here on the Gulf Coast and working internationally. Um, so this is kind of a unique opportunity you're going to get somebody that likes to fly fish but is a scientist, a retired scientist, and you're going to get somebody who has fished for a living most of his entire life and, and has done it right here in the area. So it's a really good combination. I'm just really happy Bo could be here. So again, if it's a fish, you can catch it on a fly rod. This is me with this gentleman back here, Captain Mark. Mark does the seminar series. This is his partner, Kayla, back here by the table. They do, they do the seminar series for Legendary and Destin. They happen to be really close friends and neighbors. I'm glad they could be here. But this particular fish right here, we're out on, uh, off of Destin. How far out, Mark? Ten miles? Okay. That day it was kind of wavy. No, it was really hot. That's what it was. That's why it felt like ten miles to me. <laughs> And Mark kept calling me and telling me, he goes, listen, we got some big king mackerel in areas where I know they're there at particular times. Let's go out there and get one on a fly rod. So we got the right day, and sure enough, he and I had a good day and figured out just how to hook these suckers, and it was fun. Uh, we did it with a 12-weight, full sink line, big bait pattern, it looked like a pogey. <clears throat> but instead of throwing that thing out over across a bait ball and stripping it, up, stripping it in, you just let it sink nice and slow, just like it's a wounded bait fish dropping out of the pod. 
and that, that king, and we're used to trolling for kings at a pretty good speed around here. But here's this king comes along and just soft mouths that fly, and he doesn't even move until we went and strip set the hook on him, and then that's when he took off. And then, of course, you know how it works, Bo. There's a big knot, and the fly line comes up, and luckily I had Mark on board, and we're teasing the knot out of the fly line while the, we get, trying to get this fish to hold still. But we eventually got him to the boat. It was a lot of fun. Here's Bo. Where's this? The key? At Mexico? That's, or no, that's Belize? Cape Conquer, Belize. That's in Belize? Yeah. You want to talk it. about that fish a little bit? Yeah. Uh, so it, it, it's my favorite fish. I, I, my, my first true addiction in, in fly fishing, the, the, you know, the lightning strike moment was the first time I ever saw a tarpon. And for a lot of saltwater guys, that's how it works. They're, you know, they're, they're magnificent. It, as, I have, as I have fly fished over the course of my life, this is my new addiction which is permit and and it's and it's tough because they don't live here but once once you spend a little time around them you'll you'll spend some time traveling to try to catch them it's you know it's basically an enormous pompano and and all the things that pompano are wily they have great eyesight they're fickle about where they want to feed those things just grow exponentially with every inch that becomes a permit and the more the more you can spend time around them the harder they are to catch the more the more you spend time and Addicted to do it. All right. <laughs> so fly fishermen, we've traveled all over looking for, you know, species that we want to check that box. We want to put that fish in that box. And I, I had a chance recently to go down to Costa Rica and to chase sailfish. And where'd he go? Well, there he is. He was, he was just down there in, uh, as well, looking for sailfish on fly. And... Uh, I think we both came up empty-handed, but I know I'm going back, and he just told me earlier today, so is he. <laughs> That's a big rooster I got when I was down there. We had some triple tail and mahi and you name it, it's out there. But here's another fish that's a big trophy fish for fly fishermen. It's a uh, giant trevally, a GT. Everybody wants to go catch a GT, but, you know, we've got the... Panhandle GT, right, which is the jack, and I love catching jacks on a fly rod. Pound per pound, those are mean fish, and they, they're muscle. The only fly rod I've ever broken in my life was on a j big jack in the Wrigley's over in off of Lake Pontchartrain, Louisiana, and it wasn't because of anything I did wrong. It's just the behavior of that fish and how much muscle and mass he's got and the way he can move. But... People travel all over, and you can catch just about anything there is on a fly rod. You got any jack stories? I, it, you know, I've, I've been lucky enough to fish that run a lot of years. They've, they've ruined everything I own. They, you know, <laughs> I mean, they've ruined flies. They've stripped every guy off a fly rod. You know, a, a, a fresh green jack, as soon as somebody sticks him next to the boat, if you've got a knot, it'll, it'll clear every guy off a fly rod before you're done. Yeah. And, and that's what makes them fun. You know, it's, it, they're, they're fantastic fish to to make the anybody who spent a lot of time sight casting on the flat it's a really good fish for them to make the transition to doing migratory species so when you start talking about whether it be tarpon cobia or even running redfish they're going to run so much differently than the fish that are that are trapped in six to eight inches of water what time of year spring yeah it's a it's water temperature driven yeah, well, I, you know, my answer is when the water gets 70, get, get froggy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, <clears throat> you don't hear a lot about it, but I think here in the near future, you're going to hear a lot more about guys chasing jacks with fly rods versus going all the way around the world to catch GTs. So we've got them right here. It's a very similar fish. It's just you're not, in, in your sight casting at them, you'll see them up on top. And what's, what, what nickname? For jacks around here, guys, you know there's there's lots of them. Which one are you thinking of? <laughs> Which one's acceptable Flats, to say on camera? Mafia. <laughs> <laughs> so we haven't rehearsed this. So sometimes a lot of these questions, I'm putting him on the spot. Glad, yeah, right, but so I have know. lots of answers to that, but I don't think they're all acceptable for the camera. <laughs> all right, uh, they, it's a donkey of a fish. It's you know if 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 you've never had one scorch your fingers or or really put you to the test dancing off, off your fly line. It's a really great place to start before you go and pay a guide to put you in front of a tarpon. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a fish that will take you through the motions.
Yeah. And even sail fish, and we just talked that talked about that a moment ago. They'll hit a fly. A lot of fish too. You've got to tease them in, just like with sailfish. You tease those fish in, and then it's sort of, you know, uh, bait and switch. You know, you pull that bait out of the water without a hook, and you get that fly out in front of it when it's up close to the boat. And that's a common practice, and even a practice that's done with cobia. We'll talk more about that here in just a moment. So. <clears throat> I'm going to kind of keep going back to this idea that there's a lot more to fly fishing than just catching a fish because it means so much more than that, especially to me. You know, as a biologist and how much I've been connected to the environment and literally immersed in it my entire life, it's, um, it's something that I'm just really connected to. So this author, John uh, Garrick, here's a quote. He says that fly fishing is solitary. It's contemplative. It's mis misanthropic, it's scientific in some hands, that'd be mine. It's poetic in others, I think in many ways, that's Bo Walker. And laced with conflicting aesthetic considerations. But most, off, but most of all, it's not even clear if catching fish is actually the point. So it's a common theme you, you'll hear amongst a lot of fly fishermen, because there's so much involved in just the practice of the art and the art of the cast in the chase of the fish. And that's why many of us actually practice catch and release. We catch that fish and we turn it loose. My wife always, I get home, I get to the dock, she's like, where's the meat? <laughs> where's the fish? And I'm always like, well, I, you know, I turned them loose. I want them to grow bigger, reproduce, produce more fish. <clears throat> it's important to practice catch and release. And sometimes I have a hard time convincing her of that. But hopefully the words of Flip Pallet earlier might have influenced her a little more in my direction. But this idea that there's something more to it <clears throat> is not something that's just a recent thing. You know, it's something that dates all the way back to the 1500s. Isaac Walton, had, he wrote a, a book about angling way back when. And he said that, oh, sir, doubt not that angling is an art. Is it not an art to deceive a trout with an artificial fly? So with all of that kind of fluffy stuff I'm preaching to you, the next thing I really want to tell you is that Lefty Cray, who's really uh, someone that most people in fly fishing world really look up to, and there'll never be another one, and I'm going to let Bo talk about him here in just a minute. We lost Lefty not too long ago, but Lefty said there's more BS in fly fishing than there is in a Kansas speed lot. But this is coming from a man that, you know, he spent his entire life fly fishing and teaching people how to fly fish, and in particular, how to cast. And we're, we're going to go over casting techniques and talk about casting fly rods. And a lot of that is really the insight and the knowledge that came down from Lefty Cray. Lefty actually was able to uh, actually taught a lot of the the early pioneers of saltwater fly fishing here in Florida, in South Florida. And uh, it's through Lefty and these other gentlemen that fly fishing has really grown in the state. Any idea, anything you want to say well, about I mean, Lefty? I, 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 I'm a person that doesn't make a lot of social media posts. Um, the, the night that Lefty Correa died, I, my post was the North Star on fly fishing has been extinguished. And I truly believe that. Um, Lefty was, I, I was, I had the true honor of meeting him. I, at one point, did some, my FFS certification with he and Chico Fernandez. And they, Lefty Correa could do things with a fly rod that youth, strength, height, all of those things cannot overcome what he did. So he understood the secret at a level that none of us, none of the rest of us do, including Flip Pallet, Chico Fernandez, you, you name whoever your favorite is. The answer is Lefty was 25% better than they were. It's just, and he did it with no effort. The, the, the thing that guys my height do, we overcompensate with height and power. Lefty didn't have that, didn't have that asset. He could still outcast you. I mean, I watched Lefty Correa roll cast one afternoon and we measured it, it was 86 feet. <laughs> I can barely cast 86 feet. He made a roll cast that far. So he, under, he understood not only the art, the art of fly casting, he not only understood the art of being a fisherman, 
he 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 understood he understood the dynamic on a, on, on a level that that very few people could understand, and and he tried to teach us. Yep. <clears throat> So one of the things that I do, and I do this in the Lefty Cray style, is we train people how to cast. And we do that through Fly Tide 30A over, actually out over the water, casting platforms, otherwise known as ladders, platform ladders. And we do it in a way in which Lefty liked to teach. And he had his basic principles. And the very first principle of fly casting because we can't fly cast, we can't fly fish unless we can cast. And casting, you know, is an art and it's not a difficult thing to do, but once you learn the little secrets to it, it actually becomes a very enjoyable thing. I always tell students when I'm teaching them is that it's a sport that will teach you to relax. It will slow you down. It will put you into a rhythmic movement that actually helps you to relax. My wife and I have known each other forever. We no longer have arguments. <laughs> we have conversations. And sometimes that conversation will get to the point where she'll say, hey, you need to go outside and cast that fly rod for a minute and come back in here. Because when I, when I do that, it just calms me down and slows me down. And it's very enjoyable. It's very relaxing. It, how's it for you? I, you know. Practice is extremely zen. Um, casting to a fish is a whole nother thing. Right. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, in the yard, it, it, it's fantastic. I, there's nothing I like better than tightening loops and seeing if you can shoot them through hula hoops. And then as soon as I see the wake from a tarpon, I fall to my old habits, start snatching and working. You know, I, I, as Lefty would say, I you know, look like I was going to tear my underwear. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> And, and if that doesn't still happen to you when you see a big fish, you might want to think about something else to do in right. your free time. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so one of, all right, Lefty's first principle was before you can load the rod, you've got to remove all the slack from the line. So we're going to just demo this a little bit. And do you want to do it? All right, here, I can straighten for you. You tell me what you want me to do. All right. So All right, I'm going to warn, I, 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 nuts, I had a little bit of a car accident the day after Thanksgiving. So this is the first fly cast I've made in six months. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> no pressure. So what, what Lefty is saying here is before you can load that rod, all the slack in that fly line has got to come out. So you can't have any slack in the line. The line needs to be nice and straight and tight. Whether you're starting the cast and you're picking that line up, picking that line up. <laughs> we did not practice this. <laughs> That's the only reason I, we're able to do this is because I've known him for a long time and he and I think a lot alike. So, <laughs> so you got to have all that slack out. You have any little bit of slack in that line, that's got to come out before you can start a cast or if you're False casting in the air, that line's got to roll all the way out into a nice straight tight line before you turn it back. You want to take all that slack out. The second principle that Lefty left us with was once the slack is gone, the only way you can load that rod, and when they say load the rod, that means we're putting power, transferring power into that rod, and that rod's going to bend. <clears throat> so when you do that, the only way you can do it is by moving the casting hand with ever increasing speed to a sudden stop. So it's a pull and a hard stop and the line rolls out straight and then it's a push to a hard stop and the line rolls out the other direction. And then once you get it to where you need it and you turn it loose, those rods are built to, to handle the first 30 feet of line and the other 30 feet, especially for lefty, but take the other 70 feet with it when he turned loose of it. <laughs> and every novice angler doesn't pay attention to this as much as they should. And neither did I, nor will anybody who starts. But to be honest, this, this starting moment right here, you notice the rod tips on the ground, the line straight, this much deviation, 
every bit, every every degree of DG, deviation takes power out of your cast. So, so if you start with this here, I have to take all of this slack out before I'm casting. If I start right. with this laying dead flat, I'm casting right this minute. And you see how easy that is. I mean, I, there's no there's no effort in that at all. So the more of this you have, the more of this you start doing. Right. You know, in saltwater fly fishermen, you'll see them. We we tend to rock. The best you can, take it out. I know there's wind, there's boat, there's waves, there's all those things that, that put wiggles in your line. We're standing on a flat floor with no wind. This, you know, these are optimum conditions and conditions, and they don't exist. But try to make sure, try to make sure to train yourself to finish here, because this yeah. is where you set the hook. This is where you fish. You don't fish up here. You don't fish over here, because he's going to smoke you if you do. Right. Everything that we would do to teach you to how to, on how best to cast is just like Bo just told you. It's to take that slack out of the line. Once you got the slack out of the line, you've got control of it. So the next is when your casting hand stops and the rod straightens, the line continues in the direction the rod, top, the rod tip finished as it traveled. So wherever that rod tip stops, that's the direction that line's going to go. If you drop that rod tip, as that line's coming out, you're giving it more and more instruction on where to go. So as soon as the rod tip drops, that's when it's gonna, that line's going to follow it. And then the last one, the longer the distance the rod and your arm travel during the back cast and forward cast strokes, the easier it is to make the cast. Some people, a nice little tight, it depends on where the fish is and how far you're casting and a lot of other, other variables. But a nice, tight, short cast will get that line typically where it needs to go. But if you need a longer cast and you want to put more power into it, that rod's going to come back and that, or that lever, if we're talking physics, that rod's going to come all the way back and it can come all the way back as far as being parallel to the ground before it's going to start to lose power. And the more I have to cast, and this, this comes later, I mean, you know, the, the stop and fade is something that, that Flip talks about in his early videos, which is where you get, you know, everybody talks about that 10 and 2 moment. You don't have to be married to that because you can, in fact, accentuate your cast by getting to this moment. And as soon as you've sent the loop, so it's now been telegraphed by the end of the rod, you can fade another foot or two, adding, adding stroke. So, meaning you can stop here, fade back, and finish here. So, this is your stop, but that's your forward moment. So, now what you've done is you made a stop at your standard moment, which keeps your loop nice and tight and cuts the wind. But as you fade your rod tip back, it's sort of like turbocharging your forward cast. And it takes a minute, but it, but it helps. <laughs> so, here's just a caricature of Lefty Cray throwing a fly rod. And you can see it's nice and tight, and he's bringing it up. And when he gets it here, this sucker's coming out in a straight line parallel to the water back in behind him. When he turns it, after it fully rolls out and he turns it back the other way, this is what it looks like coming forward. <clears throat> We're on a straight line parallel to the water. There's no slack in this. And if you follow the red line I've drawn here, that's just, he stopped the rod tip here, and that's just how that line's gonna come out. It's gonna come out parallel and straight to the water and it's going to continue until he stops it with his left hand and follows it down. This isn't a, a cartoon drawing, this is real life. Here's a young guy out on a flat and you can see just how nice and tight that line is. He stopped that rod tip right here and it's going to roll off and it's going to continue straight out and parallel to the water. That's a great cast right there. If we do it in full motion here, you'll see I lift the fly line up to feed it through the guides. Here's the forward cast. And when it comes back, you'll see that rod almost goes back parallel to the water. The arms out extended a little bit, not so great. <laughs> but the elbow is running parallel to 
the water on a straight line. It's not a chicken wing. That arm is, that elbow is not being lifted up and down during the cast. All right. All right, let's, talk, let's start to talk about Kobe a little bit. Anybody have questions about casting? <laughs> Dude, it's all right. Remember, this is, you know, I'm, you know, these are a couple of hundred thousand casts deep over here. So, and, and, and again, I tell people, a fly cast is a lot like a golf swing. You know, you're, 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 you're chasing something that's hard to do. It adds challenge to the water. Yeah, I haven't had the Zen moment yet. Y'all are talking about it. I have a lot of <laughs> Mine's more frustration than anything. Well, um, but like when things do come together out there, I've got a smile on my face. I may be frustrated as hell, but I've got a smile on my face. So, it's all that matters. Yeah, I love it. So. Yeah, if you're enjoying what you're doing, you're yeah, doing it right. That's why I'm here. Well, can you cast a couple more times? I'm trying to like. Sure. I mean, I I, I can't. I, I, the the thing that happens with me inside here is. And, 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 and I will say this, so I'm, I'm an old school guy. So when, and, and I'm gonna give some people credit from my past. Uh, Tommy Robinson's gonna be one of them. His brother, Chris, who's my age. You know, we all started fishing together. And, and Tommy has one of, one of the secretly best fly casts I've ever seen. He's a 120 foot caster. And when I first met guys, that's what, that, those are the things that we were trying to achieve. So we were trying to get these loops super tight, almost transparent between each other. And there's no fly, so I'm cracking whip. But so the idea there is, and there's not a lot of energy in what I'm doing, but I also am not picking a fly up off the water and I don't have a wet fly going through the air. So this is pretty easy. I mean, if you know, you know, if you understand the dynamics. So, and what you're seeing here is what Tommy taught me, which is super minute placements of my home. So when you watch this hand, this one, it's very, very minute. As that gets longer, this gets longer, that, that haul. And I'm trying not to shoot it against the wall and ruin this fly line. But you know, you, so the idea when we first started, and now we have guides who want the slap and slide, which is right there and strip. <laughs> and, and it drives me nuts. I mean, I spent my whole life learning how to cast 80 <laughs> to 90 feet. And my guide wants me to cast right there and strip for a tarpon. <laughs> It drives me bananas. It's one of the reasons why I love to permit fish because the casts are really long. It's one of the reasons I like to cobia fish. But the, the thing about it that I'll remind you is it has nothing to do with power. Being big, strong, that's got nothing to do with being a good fly caster. Technique and where you place those moments of energy has everything to do with being a fly caster. It's one of the reasons why height doesn't make you better Strength doesn't make you better. If, if you're a technical fly caster, you can, you can weigh 98 pounds and, and outcast me. And in fact, I have a friend who does, and he's about that way. Most of the people that come to the school are women, and the women are always much faster than the men to grasp the technique of casting a fly rod. They don't have a preconceived notion of how to do it. They don't try to muscle it, right? They listen. And <laughs> and, the, and, and, and lastly, is they're willing to move their body just in the right motion. They're willing to dance with the rod more so than men. It just takes, takes men a little bit longer to sort of grasp the technique, but women catch on to it just like that. I've always noticed the way, when, whether I'm teaching men or women, the, the thing that I notice about good casters I got a lot of work to do with this guy. <laughs> you see somebody who picks a rod up and has two fingers touching it, lightly leaving, that's a person that's gonna pick it up quickly. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a timing and a delicate place of power. And it, it's, so, I mean, and you'll see guys, and you see them now in the saltwater series where, you know, you see these really big rocking casts. They work. They're not super accurate, and again, the best caster I know doesn't move either one of his feet. Nope. Just like that. I did some training with Chico Fernandez, and the first thing that Chico taught me was exactly what Bo's talking about. It's when that fly, when you're hauling, it's a nice little short haul on the line that's perfectly in line 
with the rod and the reel. And it's just a tiny little haul. And the reason it's like that is because most of the, you've taken most of the slack out anyway. And now with the haul, it's just any little residual slack you're taking out. And if you do it in an alignment with the rod and the reel and you keep that straight line, you're going to have better control and you're going to have better placement of the fly. It was explained to me one time, if you were to pull your rod back and make a cast, it'll be about that far. So when you make your haul, you're adding that much more. So the rod by itself with just lying in the air is going to do what it does, right? You know, whatever this is. But if I start doing this, I start building speed, you start hearing it crack, you start seeing energy, I start hitting the door, I start hitting the window. If I, keep not, if I keep holding it in my hand and doing this, eventually this will collapse above my head. I won't have enough energy to finish. So when you're stripping it, you're it's, it's, it's adding a turbo to my cast. Yeah, it's so I'm adding up, it at the very end. Increasing the line speed by taking the slack out of the line. So it, it, it sort of ends up, if you think about it as, as a moment, the rod is bent, and as you get it to its most dynamic moment, you are pulling down, therefore overbending, and then allowing it to release. So remember, a fly cast is a ride for the most part. So what I've done here, I'm now waiting. What I've done here, I'm now waiting, right? So I'm not in charge. It's not, whoosh, I'm watching. So I've stopped, and I've stopped. So during, during what is 10 seconds of fly line in the air, I'm only giving input for about three. The rest of it, I'm a passenger. So if you don't get it right, you get to watch a train wreck happen in front of you. <laughs> and while you watch a really big fish swim away and you know you made a, you know you've made a bad cast and you know it's going to back him and it's going to spook him. You know, so if you've done it enough, when you send it, if it's wrong, you know it, you know it the minute you stop. You're like, eh. And you might have the ability to pull it back and correct, or you might not. Absolutely. I'm sorry. I'm, when do you step into showing like a beginner how to double haul? I, I will tell you that I think it's okay to let your left hand ride around your waist from the beginning, so like around here. Because if you, if everybody tells you to follow your rod tip, right? You know, to do this. That's great for guys who are going to do freshwater. And I think that's a really good teaching method. But if you're going to be pretty much an exclusive saltwater caster, go ahead and let your, rod, let your hand kind of ride over here. Because this is where you're going to eventually make that, that moment. And it's not, you know, everybody thinks it's this, you know, because we've seen these dynamic pictures in Florida Sportsman or everything else where everybody's, you know, they look like this and they've got all this line at their feet and they're trying to make this huge cast and shoot 100 feet of line above their head. Well, to be honest with you, I would much rather see you make a 70-foot cast that went right where it was supposed to be and your transition is here. I mean, that's flat, I'm ready to fish, my first strip is active. So if you do this big long thing and you shoot, you sit there and watch, like we're doing here. You know what's happened? That fly is now in the water, probably sank beneath the fish, and when you're done, you're gonna stick it underneath your arm, and you're gonna start doing this to catch up. So the idea is make a cast as far as you can make while it's in your hand, and you can go directly to fishing. Oh, tell him what Lefty Cray used to say about the double haul. Well, <laughs> yeah, it, it, you know, it, it, Lefty, A, it is, in the first part of his career was a huge fan of the single haul, which was to get it loose of the water and make a forward cast that had plenty of energy. The other thing is, is, you know, you can, you can work so hard, you can, you can look like you're trying to tear your underwear. <laughs> and, and, that's, and, it, and Lefty, like I said, could roll cast further than I can cast. <laughs> he, he also used to say... Don't use a double haul to throw a bad cast farther. So you got to keep your mechanics together. You know, to your question, as long as your mechanics are good, if somebody and they're learning and their mechanics are good now, and they've kind of got a good grasp on, on the mechanics and how to move and how to make that line move, it's then that you take them off the bunny hill and you start teaching them the double haul. Because immediately they're going to start getting a little more line speed and it actually gets easier for them once they learn the double haul. And the double haul motion is really not any different than trying to start a lawnmower. You know, it's just a pull and a recoil right back to the engine. That's how I teach it. Yeah. And people generally, when the very first three hour course, 
Before that three hours is up, people that have never touched a fly rod in their life are actually double hauling before they leave. They still need a lot of practice, but at least they've got the motion down and they've learned how to do it. So, all right. Any other questions about casting? This, we could talk hours. We could talk for days and weeks about fly casting. <clears throat> but <clears throat> we really want to get into the Kobe as well and talk about actually fly fishing and a little more about Kobe. Anything else to add, Bo? Okay. Any I'm other thinking. questions? All right. So, Cobia, Rachycentron, Canadum, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the science because I practice science and biology for 35 years plus. I worked throughout Florida and I worked internationally, <clears throat> mainly on water quality issues and habitats and other things. But the IGFA all tackle world record for Cobia is 135 pounds, nine ounces. That was in Shark Bay, Australia, back in 1985. In fly fishing, it's the 16-pound line class where the heaviest fish was caught. It weighed 83 pounds, 4 ounces, and it was caught in Key West back in January of 1986 by Jen Anson. If we look at the Florida records, <clears throat> world records, 130 pounds, for the, for the Florida record, 130 pounds, 0.06 ounces out of Destin back in 1997. Uh, Peter McAllister was the gentleman that caught it. And the Florida fly fishing tackle record's the same as the world class record, 83 pounds, 4 ounces back in January of 86 down in Key, in Key West. This is back, this is uh, the record here in Florida. Back in 1997, March of 1997, and uh, Mr. McAllister's 130 pound cobia there at the dock. Anybody here in the audience remember that one? You do. <laughs> you do. All right. I do. I did not know him, but I was certainly upset. <laughs> this is the biggest cobia known to exist in the world. Caught off the coast of Brazil back in 2019, 172 pounds. And even when you look at the scientific literature, and I'm gonna show you some, some of that information, in the literature, they didn't think this fish could get this big. They, that's a good question, I don't know. But they had to spear it three times to kill it. I wish they wouldn't have, but they speared it three times to kill it. Um, I've actually got a, a friend of the family that's from Brazil, and I ask her how to pronounce it. They call him, and I'm going to, she just laughed when I try to pronounce this, but Bijupira is the way that they pronounce the name of this fish. And it's uh, Portuguese, I guess, for tasty fish. And, but they found it down in about 85 feet of water around some pipe that had fallen off a cargo ship. And it was, it was with some other big Kobe as well, but that was the biggest one. I threw this slide in here just because this is what it used to be like around here. These guys got a 96 and 119 pound Kobe on the same day. You can watch this video online. It's an amazing video. These guys were so excited and they brought these fish into the dock at Harbor Dock. And that was back in April of 1994. You can look this one up. But there used to be, and there, there still are a lot of Kobe around. But we're not seeing many up on the beaches over the last few years, and we've even had tournaments that have had to cancel. But that's going to be part of the conversation here this afternoon. But <clears throat> if you want to catch Kobe on a fly rod, this is sort of the, the general type of setup that works well. You know, I think Bo and I both agree, you know, uh, for most of the, kind of the, the weights of the fish that you're seeing now, a 10 weight's pretty good. I always like to go big because I don't want to lose a fish. If I get a really big fish coming along, I'd rather have a bigger rod so I can handle him. But to have a 10 and a 12 on the boat is not a bad idea either. But anything from a 10 to a 12 weight, comments I, I, on that? I, I, I can't disagree. All right. I mean, I, I fish an 11 because I just won't fish even numbers. So. Right. Large Arbor Every, Reel? Everybody's got, everybody's got something that's hinky. I fish seven nines and 11s. I won't fish eights, tens, and 12s. Right. <laughs> and I love tens, I love tens and 12s. <laughs> so 
You want a reel that's got a big arbor on it and plenty of backing because it's a big fish, it's a mean fish, and it's going to move, and you're going to have to muscle him. So having plenty of backing on that reel is good. I like uh, closed drag systems. I don't like getting salt and sand in there. Um, a lot of people are good with open drag and cork drags. I don't know. What's your preference? I fish T-Bores. All right, T-Bores, open drag, having, cork. Having known Ted, I just run yep. what I have. <laughs> Nothing wrong with an open drag system. I just prefer, I like to walk the beach a lot and having a closed one and not getting sand in there is a, you know, it's a preference of mine. But uh, floating, but a medium to full sink fly line, depending on where they're at, they're up on the surface or you're fishing them around structure, you know, in deep water, fishing a full sink line with a big fly, you know, or something that's sort of a, you know, you just got a, uh, a sink tip on the end of the line or up on top. Uh, works well. I like airflow line more and more these days. There's different types of fly line for every day of the week. And, but airflow line, it's a little slicker, but the thing I like most about it is I like to make long cast too, like Bo does. And it's got a ridge on it, kind of a micro ridge. And when you're throwing far, you tend to be throwing the running portion of the fly line. And the running portion of the fly line it's really stiff. It doesn't stretch a lot. It doesn't give. And if it's going to knot up, that's the place that's going to do it. <laughs> I can tell just by the way he's looking at it and handling yeah, well, it. I mean, he knows it, what it, I'm, you know. <laughs> but they all do it. They all do it, yeah. But having the ridge to, and I'm not promoting one over the other. I'm not sponsored. But I tend to like that ridge. You don't get the... feet sometimes I like a little bit of a longer leader Bo I you know I it, it's whatever I can turn over in the wind so the way I build leaders is if if I have the fly collapsing or the loop falling apart at the end of my cast I just keep clipping it back until it stops if you can't get it there you can't catch it so you know it, it, that's that's a wind condition thing for me almost exclusively but I'm an old school guy who builds my leaders in sections with, with barrel hitches and whatnot. So when I sit down, I start, I start building a tippet from scratch and then I put a shock leader. So. Some people will put bite tippet on the end. They'll put metal down there because these things can be a little toothy. They've got little short spiny teeth. They've got rows of it. It's even in the roof of their mouth and on their tongue. Um, I typically don't do that. I think you and I talked about it. You don't do it either. I, I run something around the lip. Um, I don't tend to worry too much about the spines in their back. I try to fight the fish in a manner that knowing they're there. Um, I have lost fish to that, but I, but I think I get more bites. Yep. So somewhere between a 50 and an 80 pound on the bite end of the, the leader. And, uh, but you can go lighter. You get in clearer water. I, I think down to 30 pounds. Well, and it has to do with how lazy I am. If I start that long and I've had a fish shake off and he's abraded the first six inches, I cut that off and just retie and go back to work. Right. So. All right. And then fly patterns. E limitations are something that most people use. Um, crab imitations, I've heard people. You want to talk about some of these flies, Bob? I spend a lot of time fishing in the, and again, I haven't, the last five years, I have not, I have not stuck a cubby with a fly. But when I first started, when we first, when we first started tying flies, what I tied was something that would look a lot like a cockroach or a bunny that had a long black strip of bunny tail on. So it looked a lot like an eel. And what we were doing at the time is we were taking a very long conventional tackle rod and we were running either a piece of ribbon fish with something that was neutrally buoyant with some weight to tease him, to get him closer to the boat. Or we were using live eels. You know, we would actually slam a live eel's mouth shut with a with just a snap swivel and leave him in ice so he didn't wrap around the line. And if you could get one worked up that way, you know, what you showed him wasn't as big a problem. You know, once once he's already bit at something several times, if you pull it out of his face and you drop something there, he's probably going to hit. This is a uh, Enrique Pelagilizzi, the same guy that ties most of the tarpon flies we use these days and this is a, basically a squid and I they, this as a as a pre-made fly has been the most successful thing I've used and I like the orange you know I, I had but that's only because I had good luck with orange jigs for years 
Anybody in the audience that fishes cobia on fly? You want to share what you use fly-wise? Pattern? Bunnies. Bunnies. Long bunnies. It seems to keep that fly in that column, that flat here on top, and then you now you got back tails. I even, I, I started using the long hook shanks and putting the eyes yeah. towards the back, so if they, were, if they were too high in the water column, I would throw some lead line around them right. so I could change their, their depth. Right. But Thrown it yeah, it's been a while since anybody's gotten so bored they started with a fly rod on a cobia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's like the only question I'm going to go catch a cobia. In fine stand, I'm going to catch a cobia. I'm like, oh. And if you go, let's go catch a carp. Yeah. Like, I'm just fly fish in salt water. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's, I mean, we run the beach, we run the beach. It's hard to find now. It's much more offshore. Right. Agreed. Agreed. There's, there's another box over here with flies uh, for useful for cobia right over here on the table. You guys get a chance. You can peruse those as well. I've been playing around with pike and musky flies and adding a little bit of weight to them. You know, you'll, they're big, but if you get on something big, especially offshore with a sink, full sink line, and you get this tail wiggling as it goes down, it tends to work pretty good. <clears throat> Here's one that I know has worked really well here and off the, the coast here. Uh, sort of these crab color patterns, the greens, it's worked well. Um, but eel patterns in general. This is just another general group of all the different fly patterns that people have used. A lot of people fish for cobia up and down the uh, eastern seaboard as well and in Ches Chesapeake Bay. Fishing for Kobe and Chesapeake Bay is still really good. It's been hot pretty for the last few years. Yeah, it's doing well. The most the most fish I saw caught this week was in uh, South Carolina. Yeah, they they had they had a tournament there where they had a they had like a 68, a 62. They they, they had a group of 60s, which we ain't seen here in a long time. <laughs> you right. know, I mean the the, the hundred and eight thousand dollar fish in Destin this year weighed forty seven point eight pounds. And he had to be 45 to qualify. <laughs> We're headed in that direction really quick. <laughs> that's, that's the question on everyone's mind. I'm not sure anybody has the real answer, okay. but we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna talk about it. <laughs> I, I I I will jump in here and say one thing. There is an awful lot of opportunity for anglers to participate in cobia tag, tagging programs. Get involved, man. If you're interested in your fish, get involved. Be dedicated. Don't you know? I mean, you know, you're asking a fantastic question, and here's the answer. If you look online, they'll send you a group of tags. Stop killing cobia. Start tagging them and releasing them. Let's let's find out what is happening. We did this. We started doing this 15 years ago with tarpon, and the amount of and the amount of data we have from the Keys all the way to Texas is is exponentially growing every year. So the first few years aren't great, but once you get into that five, seven, and ten years, we start getting some data that really answers the question. Yeah. It, I. I I can't answer that question because I don't have the education to back up my opinion. Yeah, we're going to we're going to show you some some information here at the end what's known at least within the science but also just the kind of the response we're seeing from the fishermen from all along the Gulf Coast all the way from Texas down all the way to the Keys. So we're we're getting there. <laughs> Hang tight with us. <laughs> um let's see there was something else. Oh, tagging. So that rooster fish I showed you earlier. We actually tag that rooster before we turn him loose. Tagging's really important. You know, it's just we just need the we. A lot of people think the scientists have the answers, and nine times out of ten, they'll tell you they don't know, or they need to do the research. Um, it's just you need the information to be able to figure these things out, and a lot of it just isn't there. For the folks that are in the, uh, sir. I'm, I'm gonna be the newbie. You talk about tagging. I know you're talking about putting a tag on a fish. Mm -hmm. so, yep. Reports the tag. Okay. 
So where he what, caught it. what we get then is we get a we get a moment of instation and a moment of destination. And if we're lucky, then that person re-releases that fish. Doesn't always happen that way, but you know, in a perfect world, what happens is that tag gets recorded, photographed, turned over to the FWC in our state or the next state, and then that fish is re-released. If we're really lucky, we'll get more than one report off a tag. But you know, I would I was very very ardent about tagging triple tail before it got to be a problem. And it's becoming a problem now. We don't have near the migration we used to see. And they're, they're a fish that's really easy to sight cast to, so it's where a lot of people start. So we, we have tagged, at this point, you know, off my boat, we've tagged a lot of triple tail. And so we're starting to get data back. And when you, and when you tag a fish, if you record it properly, if, if you get any more information, they'll, they'll alert you. So you'll know where your fish went. And, and the nice thing is, is you know, sorry to interrupt. So, in what you were saying, spot on. You know, and the nice thing is, the more people that get involved, the better it gets. I mean, we're now putting we're now putting satellite tags on tarpon, so we not only know whether somebody finds them, we're tracking. You know, we we know where those fish are going all the time. And what we've learned in the meantime is, you know, this isn't a highway out here. Everybody thinks of these migrations as a two lane highway. They go right. That's not the case. They, yeah. they go inshore and offshore as they make that migration around our coast, and they do that under the moons. So, you know, people talk about wrong way. That fish was going the wrong way. Well, he just came in from offshore and split the beach. He'll eventually turn back around to where he's supposed to be headed. Yeah. He's just taking a little detour that day and feeding and enjoying himself. <laughs> well, you and know? data like this too sometimes will identify like important spawning areas. For example, uh, Bonefish and Tarpon Trust you know, they've identified an area for permit where they spawn down in the Keys, and they do it at a particular time of the year, so that area is protected now during the spawning season. So tagging fish is not just about, you know, where they've been and where they're going. It, it identifies some other important aspects about the fish and, and what they're actually doing. So, you know, it may not be an issue of, you know, um, not enough cobia or we've overfished the cobia, although we probably have to a certain degree. It may, they may just have shifted their migratory patterns off this beachfront where um, maybe the, the forage that they're typically after is not there anymore, it's moved on. There's warmer temperatures up the northeast coast, so maybe they're moving more in that direction. There, there's so many different variables, you know, that could be involved here, but in some of the data I'm going to show you, it's it, that fishing pressure definitely plays a role, you know. But there's other other factors that are involved as well. You know, even if it's not harvestation, just having the amount of pressure we put on Kobe along the beach can can change that migratory path. Right. Yep. Do you feel like uh, a tag on a fish also maybe will stop the next person from keeping it? Uh, you know, like you pull a fish out of the water, you know, say there's a tag. It's going to which like, state? No. <laughs> well, I feel like if I was to see... Yeah. Yeah. What state's he caught in? I feel like if I was to pull a fish up that has a tag on it, I'm going to be like, man, this is cool as hell. I'm going to take a picture, you know, do whatever it says to do, and I'm letting that thing go. I, but, that's a fantastic I, way to look at that. I think most people Share would that make opinion. some think twice about keeping the fish if they see the tag. But at the same time, getting yeah. <laughs> that happens organically. <laughs> well, for the, the newbies in the audience, you know, if you don't know how people fish for Kobe around here, this is a pretty good idea. They're running that beach out there. They're up in a tower. They're looking for, they're physically looking for the fish on top of the water and then they're throwing to it. And typically they're going to throw, even if they're fly fishing, somebody's going to be throwing a live eel at it. Um, they're going to get that fish interested, and then they're going to bait and switch and go to a fly if they can. 
This is what they look like from the surface. There's a nice pot of cobia. They it can almost look a little bit like a shark. You know, they're dark on top, they're white underneath. Um, they got a big, broad, flat head and a big mouth. But that's, that's kind of how we do it here. But you can find them on structure. They're on buoys, they're on oil platform rigs. I spent a lot of time in Louisiana catching cobia on the, cobia on, on the rig legs. Um, they're a pelagic fish, but they like to get up in and around structure, uh, anything that's floating. In my log, I caught one on the 14th day of September in the site of the 79 bridge in West Bay. On, on the top, on a plug. Yeah. Oh, on a plug? He was, he was 31 inches. <laughs> so that gives you an idea of what they can, in fact, do if they choose to. <clears throat> this is my um, commercial break here. I wanted to encourage you to buy a boat from Legendary Marine. You want to catch a, a, a nice big Kobe or any other fish in the Gulf of Mexico, these guys can help you do it. <laughs> and Chuck didn't ask me to do this. I decided to do this on my own. <laughs> but that's a really nice Everglades boat there. Mark runs in Everglades back there and uh, with a tower on it. But that's a pretty nice ride for doing some Kobe fishing off the Emerald Coast here. John, I hate to do it. I'm going to sit down on you. Oh, yeah. Well, pull your chair up here, Bo. Yeah. I, sorry, I had, a, I had a little car accident the day after Thanksgiving, and this is, this, is, this is the first day I've been allowed to stand without my crutch or my brace. <laughs> hey, wait, bring it up here, Bo. You are, you are too kind. This, this, is a, this is a good time because we're going to start talking more science now, but we're going to go th quickly through this So I'm going to be real quiet. <laughs> 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 These fish are tropical to semi-tropical. They're, they've got a wide distribution. About the only place you don't find them is over here in the Eastern Pacific. So it's a fish that you can find in many places around the world. <clears throat> and a lot of people around the world love to eat them just like we do. Um, it's just taxonomic information about how the fish was named and when. This, it was named by Linnaeus all the way back in 1766. And you can see a big long list of synonyms for it. All that should tell you is that <clears throat> scientists don't always know what they're talking about in the early days. It takes a lot of information to finally get a grip on exactly what's going on. But one thing, it's the genus uh, Rachycentron. If you break it down, it's Greek. And really, it just means spine, and it means sting. So it's got some big spines on the back end of it that can sting you, and that's where the name was created. And when we were talking about leader, guys, just going back to some tax stuff, that's your issue, is right here, between the dorsal fin and the head. So yep. if he shakes his head, that's where you're gonna have a strike issue. So think about, think about how big a cobia you think you're gonna deal with, and try to have enough bite tippet for that. All right. And it's this is a couple of cobia taken off the rigs. Here they are following along with the big ray. They follow turtles. They tend to like to follow things that are moving like that. It's structure, but they're scaring things up off the bottom and it's an opportunity for them to feed. So a lot of people use drones these days as well. They'll get out there with a drone, they'll look for a big ray. And from the ray, then they start looking you know, for, for cobia that are following along. Never heard of that happening. I, I think John's wrong. There's no such thing, no such thing as a drum. <laughs> That's all hearsay. I have no knowledge of that at this time, Senator. The only thing I really want you to take from this big long slide of words here is that uh, this particular fish, it's the only member in its entire family. Family of fishes, typically there's like two or 300 different fish that are all related, you know, within that family. This fish is one of a kind. It's the only member in the entire family. And there's some unique um, attributes about this fish that are very unique to it, and primarily because it's one of a kind in its family. Uh, the only other fish it's really closely related to are the remoras. And you'll actually see remoras swimming along with uh, these fish. So there's nothing else in the genome even? No. Really? No. The only one. That's, that's the, first, the only one in the family. I, I, I did not know that. Yep. 
<clears throat> I bet you didn't know that it's actually Kobe or Les Sespian. Did I you know that? I didn't. It's got nothing to do I've with never seen sexual him in a orientation plane, either. <laughs> Absolutely nothing to do with that. That's just that they're, these fish also migrate. They'll go through the Suez Canal and they'll go from the Red Sea into the Mediterranean. And only because the Suez Canal is there. So there's, you know, scientists have put a name on it. But you can find them in the Med as well. I mentioned to you earlier, the dentition, the teeth, they've got these really small spiny teeth. It's basically just to help to grab a hold of something. They don't chew with them. They just swallow their prey whole. And it's, those teeth are even up on the roof of their mouth and on their tongue. <clears throat> they can weigh up, according to the science, 135 pounds, but we've already showed you 170 pound fish, right? So that was a pretty unique fish, but they can get much larger than 135 pounds. Typically they're around 50 pounds or so. 20 to 47 inches long, maximum of about 79 inches. They grow really fast. And that's a good thing because given their growth rate, it makes them a great candidate for aquaculture. And I'm gonna show you guys a short film here in a little, just a little bit. Where people are growing cobia out. They're doing it all over the world. It started in Taiwan, but they do it down here off of Panama as well. And actually Publix is actually selling cobia fillets that come from Panama, uh, the aquaculture or mariculture of cobia off the coast of Panama. Um, and they primarily feed on crustaceans like crabs, cephalopods, which are uh, squid. They eat bait fish. But I've got a paper over here where a study was actually done where they've looked at the gut content of cobia here in the northern Gulf of Mexico. And uh, it's a really interesting paper because you get to see exactly what they're feeding on. If you're a fisherman and you're, putting, and you're, bringing a, you're killing a fish, you're going to open him up typically to see what he's feeding on because in, you know, in the future when you go back, you're going to want to try and match up with what you think they're actually feeding on at that time of year. But one of the things they really love, especially as adults, it's not just squid, it's crab, and portunid crab in particular. And all portunid means is that it's a swimming crab. That back paddle is flattened so that it can swim. They love blue crab, they love any kind of crab that swims. And the gut content analyses that's been done <clears throat> here in the, north, north, uh, the northern Gulf of Mexico shows that. Here it is, here's the, the information. It was done in 1996. And if they're uh, juvenile cobia under a certain size, they're primarily eating anchovies. That's what they're finding primarily in the gut. And that's this fish right here, all the way to the right. When they get older, <clears throat> more adult, they're eating crab and they're eating a lot of eel as well. Does any, can anybody tell, tell me here where the eels we use for these guys come from? They are freshwater. That is, the, the eels you mm -hmm. buy from Half Edge have never seen salt water. So it has to do with their movement. So when you think about fly fishing, that gives you an idea of this fish eats something for a reason other than the fact that he's surrounded by it. He's instigated by a bite instinct that has to do with the movement of your bait, as opposed to the fact that he's surrounded by its bait. Now, he will also eat saltwater eels. They just won't stay alive, so bait shops buy freshwater eels because you can't kill them. We used to catch them in the Apalachicola River as a kid and sell them to half inch. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the other thing too is eels primarily come out of the Sargasso Sea and they began in salt water but they work their way up into fresh water and one of the things that's happening right now is that we've got this huge sargassum belt that runs all the way from Africa, West Africa, all the way over to Brazil, <clears throat> all through the Caribbean and it's a huge amount of sargassum. And who knows, in some ways it may be a good thing for some aspects of fishing and fish production, but when it gets up on the coastline, it stacks up on beaches, it can be extremely problematic. They just don't know yet, and this is a fairly new phenomenon. So who knows what kind of impact that has on eels actually coming here along 
the northwest coast of Florida. You know, are the yields still coming out of the Sargasso Sea and moving in the same numbers they used to in this area? Or are they getting diverted because there's a lot more habitat and there's a lot of Sargassum that's moved out and across the Caribbean all the way over to West Africa? We don't know. <clears throat> I love this picture and I'm going to circle back to about what I love about fly fishing. There's an art to it, right? And you can tell this geeky biologist with her blue painted fingernails and the same color as that blue crab has a real appreciation for the art and the, and, and the structure in nature. So that crab right there is a female and it's a female that's about to undergo what's called the terminal molt. <clears throat> and you can tell by the coloration here on the apron and females can store sperm for a couple of years and they move in the early spring and early summer they move from the upper estuaries and they move out to the edge to, and you'll see them, they'll, they'll burrow in, along, in the sand in along the beach and they'll release the eggs and then the larvae move offshore, develop and end up migrating back in to repeat the cycle. It's another thing that may be happening with cobia. There may not be as many blue crabs, especially the females moving out to the edge of the beach to spawn. Cobia are coming in the spring, they're not just eating eel, we know from gut content analyses, they love crab. And if the crabs aren't there, they may be looking elsewhere for, you know, the, the food items, the prey items that they need. All right. So reproduction, they aggregate, they pull together into big groups. They actually spawn in daylight, not at night. <clears throat> it's open broadcast spawning. They release egg and sperm into the water. Um, and what's really incredible about Kobe is that once those eggs are fertilized, things happen really fast. Um, it's only 24 to 36 hours after fertilization that the larvae are actually released from the egg. That's fast. You know, you go from egg to a larvae just within 24 hours. It's pretty incredible. And then only five days after hatching, you actually get mouth and eye development and these things actually start to feed. So you'll get a larvae that's actually feeding only five days actually after it's been uh, released from the egg. This is what it looks like. <clears throat> Not many people get to see Kobe eggs, but that's a Kobe egg right there. One day post hatch, that's what the larvae looks like in the very first day. 10 days, you can see the eye and the mouth part here. And then there's a 27-day post-hatch larvae that's actually out there swimming around and feeding. By the way, this is the scale in which I measure all my fish by in inches. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to let everybody know. <laughs> yeah, each inch, is about, each inch is about that long. <laughs> what, what weight rod do you use? Eh, you know. <laughs> this is the part that's very unique about cobia. There's some uh, interesting parasites that you'll find in the gut that are specific primarily just to cobia. And you don't have to worry about them as long as you're eating the mussel and you're cooking it, everything's fine. It's not a problem for humans to consume it. But there's some very interesting <clears throat> parasites that have co-evolved just with cobia. There's some folks actually that have worked on this over in the Gulf Coast Research Lab in Mississippi. I was a biologist, this was one of my favorite books here, Marine Maladies, and he put a question mark. <clears throat> Worms, germs, and other symbionts from the northern Gulf of Mexico. These guys were looking at some crazy stuff, and uh, they continue to do that over there. They do a really good job. <clears throat> Overstreet's gone these days. He's, he's passed, on, passed on, unfortunately. So I want to show you another quick short video. Okay, good, we're on time. We're not going to hold you too much longer. We wanted to break up some of just the, uh, the preaching that we're doing up here and throw in some short videos that are a little more entertaining. Let's see here. Actually, I've got two. Oh, let's see. 
All right. This is about culture, culturing Kobe off the coast of Panama. Oh. Right now, you and I are in the middle of the largest deep water open ocean farm in the world. My name is Brian O'Hanlon, founder of Open Blue. And I'd like to take you on a personal tour of our operation and show you how much care and respect goes into every healthy, sustainable, and delicious fish we raise from egg to plate. Here along the Caribbean coast of Panama and nestled among the palm trees is our state-of-the-art hatchery. This is where the story begins. <coughs> the tiny fish in the tank below you hatched from an egg just nine days ago, and at this stage, they are very sensitive to feeding them. The team takes extra care when feeding These them. These fish aren't couch potatoes algae. crowded in murky water. For nearly a year, they live in this pristine, pure environment with ocean currents, so they'd never see the same water twice. The results speak for themselves. The fish are now fish have a fresh, old. clean taste as they get stronger and they move into the nursery. A single eight ounce serving of open fish meal provides the recommended dose of heart healthy omega 3 for an entire week. Vitamins and minerals created specifically for them. Very soon they will be ready to move again, this time into the open ocean. Our farms are one of a kind. They are located eight miles offshore, over the horizon, where the water is deep, the currents are strong, and the oxygen is rich. By moving so far offshore, away from sensitive ecosystems and crowded coastal waters, we can operate our farms in harmony with the ocean and local communities. This is a sea station, the most advanced open ocean pen system in the world. Fully submersible, it is as tall as a seven-story building and a third of a football field wide. The sheer scale of the structure creates an oasis for other forms of marine life. This technology allows us to locate our farms in the best environment possible for the health of the fish and the ocean. It's a tough environment to work in, but our team is out here on a daily basis checking on the fish, caring for them, and feeding them. These fish aren't couch potatoes crowded in murky water. For nearly a year, they live in this pristine, pure environment with ocean currents, so they'd never see the same water twice. The results speak for themselves. Our fish have a fresh, clean taste and a firm but delicate texture. A single eight ounce serving of open blue cobia provides the recommended dose of heart healthy omega-3 for an entire week. Within eight hours of harvest, the fish are cleaned and packed to the highest food quality and safety standards for shipping to our customers worldwide. Within 48 hours, they're in New York City's Chelsea Market, ready to be transformed by talented chefs. I'm 
never cleaned a fish nor eaten one that was cooked in, or cleaned in any of these. This is really one of the most versatile fish I've ever worked with. It's great in a variety of preparations. Over here we have it in a, a flash seared preparation, tataki style. Uh, we've got it pan seared as well. It's got an excellent skin that crisps up really nicely. Uh, you have grilled in front of you. We also have marinated here in a poke preparation. And then finally, in its most simplistic state where you truly get the essence of the fish, uh, sashimi. Yeah, that looks great. This grilled fish looks really good. I'm gonna dig in and give it a taste. Okay, enjoy. You can see right there how well it flakes up, which is excellent. Mm, really good. All right. With a deep reverence for the world around us, we are committed to taking care of the delicate ecosystem of fish, ocean, and people. Our quest is to provide fish that nourish current and future generations in harmony with the ocean. This is at the heart of all that we do at Open Blue. See a big shark here off to the right that's going to come by. There it is. That's a big one. To find Open Blue Cobia near you, visit openblue.com. John, are some of those fish pale and opaque like that because of the farm raising, as opposed to the ones in that picture that had the stripes, which I'm way more used to? So the ones that are ready to reproduce will develop the stripes like that. Okay. You know, the thing too, um, I'm a huge proponent of mariculture, I think. Wild fish, let's turn them loose. Catch and release. Practice catch and release. Turn those fish loose. If we can culture fish in a, in a, you know, in a, in a very conscious way, and it's not a, you know, it's still a, a science that's developing. And there's some downsides to it, but open ocean mariculture of a number of seafood items, I think, is probably the future if we're going to continue to eat seafood and have it in a quantity that makes sense, you know, for the, to serve the public. I want to show you one more slide here. We're trying to mix it up, and I want you to have, uh, it's not just about fishing. We fish sometimes, just like my wife likes me to. She wants me to fish so she can eat. So eating fish is a big part of it. That's why we catch, a lot of people catch them. They want to eat the fish. And I want to show you one more short video, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about what's going on with cobia. Let's see here. I'm Brad Kilgore, and I'm from Kansas City, but I live in Miami. So the restaurant we're at now is Burge. It's located in the Concourse Club, right outside of Miami. You know, Cuban comfort food. It's very approachable. It's not intimidating. It's flavors that you grew up eating. For me, the inspiration um, definitely comes from the ingredients. So for me, Open Blue Cobia speaks more about ingredients and sustainability than anything else on the planet. So. I really like to utilize and support the companies that are doing something for the next generation. So I was raised in a small city called Jacksonville, north of Florida, and the first deep sea fishing trip I ever went on, I caught a cobia. So this actually kind of speaks to my uh, childhood a little bit as well. Cobia for me, it, it plays so many different roles, right? There's like this high oil content, which gives you buttery finishes on a roasted piece of fish, or even like a crudo to do a light cure on there. Uh, I think the versatility really just kind of speaks to me um, to be the, the most versatile fish out there. So if you've never used or worked with open blue cobia, I think it's a great fish for the home cook too because it's a very indestructible fish, right? Like you can roast it, over roast it, and it's still gonna be really juicy and clean. Uh, so it's kind, of, it, it's kind of set up for your mistake. The day I found out I was a chef was the day I found my true identity. And I think as a chef, we're always gonna be searching, like who are we as a chef? I remember it was, it was a few years after working with John George and I just woke up and I was like, this is, this is me, this is who I am. It's lots of herbs, it's lots of acid, it's lots of olive oil, it's fresh, it's light. And I think that is the most pinnacle point in a, in a chef's career.
Was that the guy from Black Bear? You see, and you see here at the end, I think Publix is now carrying these cobia fillets that are coming out of this mariculture facility down in Panama. Is it down in Panama because it's not legal in the U.S.? Or is there a reason for that? No, it's, it's probably um, a number of reasons. One, it's easier access to the water quality and the water depth that they need. They just have access to all the, the things that they need to make that operation work financially and, and ecologically, right? Let's get rid of this. All righty. All right, so we just got a, two or three more slides and that's it, we've wrapped it up. and. Thankfully, we're pretty much right on time, but you know, it's your question from earlier. Where are the cobia? What's going on? What's the problem? You know, and here's a quote from a captain, Captain Corky Decker. Anybody know Corky Decker? All right. Well, back in 2010, they had a cobia run over a couple of months, and they were fishing hard, specifically fishing for cobia. And this is a quote from Corey. He said, huge numbers of fish charged through on their way to spawn in areas to the west. We logged over 250 fish on board Gordon Gill's 55 foot Hatteras, never better, from April 1st to May 10th. 250 fish. <clears throat> they finally called it a season on May 10th. With so many fish each day, they had the perfect opportunity to actually try catching Kobe on a fly rod. <laughs> Which is a good thing because they said it wasn't all that easy. The re and this is a picture of these guys landing a fish here, but the reason, that's only 10 years ago, and they're catching, t you know, they're, they've, got, they've got on to 250 fish, and Bo, how many guys do you know of that's out there about every day that hadn't seen a fish? Well, I mean, for the last, since pre-COVID, I haven't heard anything like that. Um, you know, I was, I was just sitting here thinking, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to both have a boat to launch off of Grayton and be cobia fishing then and a little before then. And I think the best week we ever had was somewhere around 78. And, you know, and that was in a seven day week and not all those fish were legal. So, mm -hmm. and which, I mean, we, we, you know, we had, we, you know, we had seven days of, of double digit fish. Right. And they, you know, we haven't heard of anything like that. Now, again, we're not talking about shovel heads, everyone. We're, we're talking about overall numbers. We're talking about light tackle. We're talking about fly fishing for some of them. But I, that's, I've never heard of anything like that. Right. Well, there's just a lack of fish. We've had tournaments canceled. We don't see many fish. And I want to show you some of the data from NOAA. <clears throat> and I've talked to some of the fisheries managers and this is basically what we're getting they're, they're telling me. First off, they've done something here. It's called something's fishy with cobia. Basically, all that means is they're acquiring information and feedback from fishermen. Just like tagging, any information or any concerns or anything you're seeing going on with a particular population out here in the Gulf, there's a number. You can call it. You can call the fisheries uh, council. You can call NOAA. Get in touch with fish and wildlife. Let them know what you're seeing. You guys are the eyes on the water. You're sometimes, oftentimes, the first one to see it. And there's not always a biologist out there floating around on a research boat. So it's good to, to let people know what you're seeing. And with this, this is a response from 2020. And just to explain this really easily, you can see these are their zones where they're getting responses and the darker color is where they're getting a higher number of responses from fishermen and usually the higher the response number there's something going on there's a problem typically they're not calling to say they're having a great fishing day right there's millions of fish they're usually only calling when there's a problem and you'll look right up here right where we are everywhere else not so bad but you get up in this region where we are, that's where you get the highest number of responses coming in where people are calling and voicing concerns. And then if you look in the same regions, these little pie charts, the more red you see in the pie, that's where they're actually complaining. There's a, there's, their, their, their response is considered 
you know, something is, is wrong, there's a problem. And you can see with this, again, right where we are is where we've got the highest number of people complaining that there's a problem here. So <clears throat> they don't really know what's going on. But they do tell us that given the information that they have, that Kobe are in a precarious state with overfishing. It's something too to remember, especially in government. I've worked in government in the past. They make a distinction between overfishing and overfished. And overfishing just means you've got a lot of people bringing in a lot of fish. Overfished means that the population's been impacted to a degree to where it may be difficult to bring them back. They feel like there's certainly a diminished population of cobia, that it has been impacted, and there's because they can see that there's overfishing in biomass. The actually weight of fish that are being brought in has been reduced, significantly reduced. But the stock, they don't believe, is yet overfished. We may not be seeing fish here on the beach, but they're certainly seeing lots of cobia in other places, right? In the Gulf of Mexico. And this is a regional approach that NOAA takes when they try to evaluate the stocks. <clears throat> that doesn't help us out much. We still have a problem here. Something's changed here, but we don't know what it is. And I think the more information we can garner from people that have their eyes on the water and the more response that we can give here, the better able there, there is likely to be dollars put forth to where people can actually do the research to kind of try and tackle a problem and to figure out what's going on. But certainly, they're looking at changing the rules in terms of how many fish you can take, how big the fish can be. There's a, if I showed you the document, you would just get up and leave. It's just a big, huge document of a bunch of alternatives that they haven't really decided on yet. But <clears throat> eventually, I think, and I think this is to Bo's point earlier, you're probably going to eventually see a reduction in the size and the number of cobia that you can take until we start to see some rebound in the population. Bo? Well, and I, you know, it, I, I think I see this same thing happening with another species. So, you know, having been somebody who started cobia fishing when I was 12 or 13 years old, I can remember during my lifetime, and I've spent a lot of time in some bays around here, and I've been really fortunate, but I can remember a time in my lifetime where we didn't spend any time triple tail fishing at all. That's no longer the case. If, if we don't start monitoring the harvestation of triple tail now, we're going to have this same problem due to pressure, I believe. And I, I don't have the education John does. What I'm telling you is I've seen, I've seen what happens when all you see going up and down the beach is people looking for cobia. We don't have cobia anymore. Now, that does not mean we have less cobia in general. To John's point, it means they're not swimming down our beach anymore because eventually they're going to stop going where people kill them all day, every day. Apalachicola Bay, when I was a kid, catching a triple tail on Apalachicola Bay was a joke. I mean, we did it on the way home for dinner. You took one to your mother because they tasted so good. Now we have every, every bay boat in Georgia with a tower on it. It's killing a limit of triple tail every, every, every time they leave the dock, if not two a day. And I'm gonna tell you that I think in another five years, we'll have this same critical problem with triple tail. Fish that swim on the surface that are sight, that are sight cast available are exciting. We have to learn not to kill and eat every one of them. I'm not saying don't, don't be a successful fisherman. Average your aggregate bag, man. You know, if you wanna kill and eat a triple tail or a cobia, be my guest. Tag two every time you do. Don't kill one till you've tagged it. Set, set limitations for yourself. Be a better angler. Be, don't be better than the next guy. Be better anglers. I mean, I, I quit being a competitive angler 25 years ago. The only person I compete with is myself. You know, you want a reward for dinner? Stick two tags, man. <laughs> I mean, because they are, in fact, sitting in a grocer's cabinet, grown in a pen in, in Panama. So you don't, in fact, have to hurt any of what are an asset here that if there's any captains in this crowd or how you make your living, if there's anybody who spends their days running trips on the water, this is, this is flora fauna, whether you do nature, whether you do charters, when, when you have a problem with a group of fish, 
it has a financial impact on people who work really hard to make their livings. If anybody thinks that making a living as a guide is easy, I dare you to do it for a week the way we do it, <laughs> if you mean it, and if you can live through it. You're, you, yeah, I mean, yeah any, anybody on earth who says, I'm going to retire and be a fishing guide is a fool. Because you're not in the shape to be a fishing guide when you're retired. You know, I retired at 20 to become a fishing guide, knowing I'd have to work till I die. But I did it while I was young enough to be great at it. And, I, and I'm not saying I was great at it. I had the ability. And, and the long and the short of it is, this is an asset that, that an awful lot of people who care a lot more than you believe are, are managing. And they are tagging these fish, and they are tracking these fish. And I mean, you know, I mean, you, you have to think about guys like, and I want to brag on my friends, Brett Martina. There were 15,000 redfish fries put into Apalachicola Bay this year solely because of his efforts. And that's, that's a healthy bay, guys. This is preventative maintenance. Yeah. Don't, don't, let, don't let it get in the red before you react. Let, let me add to that, Bo. There, I didn't tell you about a study, that, not a study, but an action that occurred in South Carolina not too long ago. They actually released cobia into the environment in the bay there. And it tracked the genetics of those fish over time. And they actually had a significant impact on cobia fishery in that air, in that localized area just from those fish that they released there. So it can make a difference and it doesn't take a lot of fish to do it, really. <clears throat> so there's things that can be done. And let me get to your question here real quick. We got five minutes and I definitely at this point, as long as I'm not cutting you off, I want, I'd like to get as much feedback as I can from you guys, especially you guys that are spending time on the water um, just to hear what you think's going on with Cobia and what you think needs to be done and just your insight into it. But we got a question right here first. Actually, and now that Bo said it, I've got three quick questions. First, what you just said, are there any organizations that we can be a part of that, Absolutely. that helps do what you just said? I mean, there's, there's, I'm a founding member Captain. of the, the association that protects triple tail, and I believe it's, a, it's something that we need to do because it's about as much fun as you can have for free in a bay if it's good. I believe, and I know there's part of the IGFA, and I know there, there, there are sectors that are watching and tracking cobia through the entire migration from Texas all the way down around the tip of Florida and back up. Yeah. Um, those, and, and literally with 15 minutes on, on Google, you can have tags being sent to your house. Same thing with tarpon. You can have mouth swabs, and you can have the sponges to do your DNA test for, for a tarpon in 15 minutes, man. They send them to you for free. So... Yeah. Uh, as I said earlier, I, I'm so I'm so new to this. I've never even held a, a rod yet, but I'm going to. <laughs> um, after I learn the fundamentals, and it's time for me to get on the water, and I'm primarily interested in shallow type fishing. I'm not really interested in going out in the ocean. Is there a particular fish that's good for a beginner to learn on? Uh, hungry, to hungry one. <laughs> yeah, there's a ton of them out there. <laughs> okay. Speckled trout's a good one. Just throwing a clouser, a deceiver, and. Bluefish, ladyfish. I'm, I'm going to go Lady way fish. less royal than he's going. Bluefish, ladyfish, yeah. all the all the fish that, that bite quick and are easy. They're going to teach you how to set hooks, not trout set. They're going to teach you how to work your rod. They're going to teach you how to trick them. And and you know, you know, don't let the ladyfish poop on you. Don't stick your fingers in the bluefish mouth. <laughs> yeah. all right, last quick question. When I start something like this, I tend to geek out and like to read about it, kind of study it. You won't even be close to the biggest geek in this field. Just go yeah. ahead, go, you're go good, ahead and you're let in it good happen. Company man. when it comes to <laughs> geeks, you'll never be as big a geek in fishing, fly fishing as. <laughs> We're as geeky as it comes. Oh, uh, yeah. There's a. So many. Of them. <laughs> you, you, you just type in saltwater fly fishing, and you'll get 300 pages. Oh yeah. Yeah. You don't pay for yeah. any any information. CCA yeah. is a fantastic asset. Yeah. Be a member, support. Coastal Conservation Association. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. Yeah. Cap Captains for Clean Waters out there as well. That's a good one. They've got no had a lot of IGFA, of course. Yeah, to be a supporting member. Because you know it's just trickle it's trickle down. Yep. A really good a really good one. It's a magazine though. It's specific to fly fishing. It's tail. It's called T A I L tail. Saltwater fly fishing magazine, which is a really good one. Um, but there's a million of them out there. Okay. Yep. I wanted to get some insight from you guys that are out on the water. You know, what are you guys thinking about cobia? Any any, any idea? Any any insight? You know, I have a strong opinion on it. Let's hear it, Mark. Man, lay it on me, man. <laughs> so, I love a strong opinion. I'm a full-time guy now, but before that, I was a snow skier, and I patterned the weather systems moving across the country. Oh, yeah. And my ski trips and seeing which years were good snow years out west and when were good and bad Kobe years and I mean you guys all can agree there were good Kobe years and low. Even when it was good we Even had we had highs and lows. Yeah so like it was really really good and it kind of slow for a couple of years and then really good again and I don't have the time or the history to go through it but I think there's a the pattern I notice is a strong correlation between El Nino and La Nina and the Kobe, which I would love to have like a <coughs> college program go study all the history on it and see if there's anything there. But the big Kobe years, especially because land-based fishermen post everything that they do and the peer data and the, you know, the peer fishermen have pictures of everything since cameras were invented. And the big Kobe years off the sea, because if anyone's going to see it on the beach, it's the Guys, because they're out there all day, every day, and if they catch something on land, they're going to let everybody know about it. Um, and yeah, pure fishermen talk. <laughs> pier years and, and the Kobe years, I think, have some direct correlation with the El Nino Southern Oscillation kicking in. Off the but I don't know. I, I can't thing. speak directly to it, but before <laughs> I came here tonight, and, I, and when I was a guide, I kept detailed log books, and I still own. And so the. Uh, I can tell you that in 2005, I caught a 31 inch Kobe on a top water plug while I was looking at the 78 bridge in seven inches of water. That's a fact, that happened. I have a picture of my customer with it. So that'll give you an idea of how far into the bay Kobe were permeating at that point. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's, I mean that's, that's a long way from an opening to the Gulf of Mexico, no matter how you cut it. You know, I mean, I was at the mouth of what is the intercoastal going to Chocachi Bay. Um, in oh, and that was in 06. In 07, I think I had my best Kobe a year ever. So I don't know what El Nino was doing, but I looked over my numbers, and I believe number wise, we stuck as many fish that year as we stuck any other year. 07? Yeah. In 06, in 06, they traveled very far into the back. So I was guide back 2009 to about 15, 15, and I was part of the problem. One of those people that go out and kill 50 or 100 fish and take them. Uh, okay. But if that was an 09 or, or 10, right? That was when that was. But we had great years after that. We uh, up to about 14. And everybody went broke. Nobody was fishing after 08. <laughs> Nobody could afford to run their billfish boats after the land crash. <laughs> Yeah. And is there is there a Gulf Stream water temperature change that's keeping them from making the hook into the Gulf? Yeah, that's a possibility too. Kind of the well, I mean, like I said, the the only tournament that I've watched this year, and like I said, you know, the, there was a hundred eight thousand dollar fish that weighed forty seven point eight pounds out of Destin this year. Only fish that was weighed forty five was the minimum. And and yesterday, day before yesterday, and somewhere in South Carolina, they 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 weighed. Five fish over sixty-five pounds that are all in the in the one, two, three, five, two, five position. It seems like the majority of the migration is going up east. And that's, that's what I've noticed too. So 
when I was walking, because I, I started because I looked for snow storms coming across. And fun fact, I just Googled El Nino years, and it had top five El Nino years ever in 97. Those, and, and I sat at Crooked Island during the, during the Manta Ray run, and, and we released every fish, but we caught, we caught them on fly rods. We caught them on spinning rods. But, and, and I caught them like I catch tarp, and I put the anchor out and sat there and casted it. I mean, I never moved. <laughs> yeah, I was, it was me and another guy with a fly rod and a spinning rod, and we, we just staked up in the right spot and let them, let them go past us and picked them up. It's super interesting that you that you looked that up. And I appreciate it because, like I said, I I look I looked at I looked at my logbooks before I came. <laughs> Well, I started at Sea Hags and Steen Hatchie and follow them all the way to, to Pensacola. And it's one thing when they're doing it with redfish that are residents and trout that are residents because Louisiana is, is sportsman's paradise. And it has a nursery that will support that. Let me say that a different way. The state of Louisiana believes that it will support, support the harvestation that they, have, that they have allowed. I do not know that I agree, but, but they also have a nursery there that we don't have here. You know, the, the, the Biloxi Marsh yeah. is one of the most healthy estuaries.